Good day, everyone. I can see so many people streaming in right about now. Um, anyway, welcome to the virtual book launch for teaching online by kindergarten and primary school teachers. I'll just give it a little bit of time for everyone to um, settle in. Um, kindly mute your mics and for better network reception, you may uh, feel free to turn off your cameras. Um, yes, I'll just give another few minutes to go. I can see it's coming in. It takes some time. <laughs> So if we are here, again, I'll just emphasize, uh, can you mute your mics? And for better network re reception, you may uh, feel free to turn off your cameras. We will, we will start shortly. All right, I'll just go ahead and start and um, let the attendees just come through just so that we are in, uh, on time. So firstly, good day, everyone. Welcome once again to the virtual book launch of Teaching Online for Kindergarten and Primary School Teachers hosted by Routledge and supported by the University of Sutherland. My name is Melanie Yustri and I am pleased to be your host for today's launch event. There will be an exciting lineup today as we hear from the author, uh, followed by a panel discussion and we will definitely close off with a Q&A segment. And if you have any questions during the session, please type them in the chat box. I think there's a Q&A segment, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom um, of the screen. Um, and we will address uh, all the questions at the end of the session. Um, do stay tuned till the end as we'll be offering an exclusive 30% discount code for you to read to enjoy for just for this launch. All right. Um, okay, so joining us today um, for the launch, of course, would be uh, none other than the author himself and also two panelists from the University of Sutherland. I'll just go ahead and briefly introduce um, the three of them. Um, firstly would be the author, Greg McCroy. He's uh, both uh, PGC and Masters Educated in Education. He has two teaching licenses from the UK. Uh, QTS and QTLS, making him eligible to teach a range of age and trained adults. With uh, two successful careers behind him, he moved into education around seven years ago and has experienced great success working in kindergartens, primary schools, and as a part-time faculty member at the Sutherland University, where he actively contributes guest as guest lectures, completes observations of teachers' trainees, and was recently a keynote speaker at their education conference. He is also currently working in senior leadership for a large North Anglia school in China and has run training sessions both regionally and globally for this vast school group. He has won multiple awards, including 2019 Teacher of the Year in Vietnam and North Anglia's Exceptional Service Award in 2022. He has a range of professional publication with magazines such as TS and has a range of peer-reviewed academic journal publication, even making it into the quarter one education journals. He's able to, he is also the brilliant mind behind the new launch title today, Teaching Online for Kindergarten and Primary Teachers. You'll be hearing from him in a short while, uh, but I also like to share, if you're curious, the two ladies on the screen, aside from myself, um, those are the two panelists from the University of Sutherland. Dr. Elizabeth Hitson and Vicky Wynn. Dr. Elizabeth Hitson's education and career began in, with teaching computing, um, then school senior leadership and regional secondments. After 14 years in schools, secondary schools, she moved on to higher education and she has been a researcher on a range of international education technology research projects, as well as teaching on PGCE, MA and doctoral training courses at Durman University and Newcastle University. In 2018, she joined the International Initial Teacher Training Team at the University of Sutherland. She is now the program leader for the UK-based blended learning, SEITT, PG Cert education course, and a module leader for the master's level school-based research module. 
on the PGCE education. Oh, this is a long one. PGCE education and PGCE education with IQTS courses delivered via distance learning to over 500 students around the world each year. Dr. Elizabeth's research interests include digital edition of learning to teach in secondary. Sorry, Dr. Elizabeth's research interests include digital tools for reflective practice. She is also the co editor of the ninth edition of the learning to teach in the secondary school, also is also published by Routledge. Uh, she continues to combine practitioner research and dissemination with her commitment to teacher education. And last but not least would be Vicky Wynn. She is the senior lecturer at the University of Sutherland and program leader for the PGC Early Years Teaching. She is definitely passionate in supporting early years practitioner and empowering the early years community to, to network, allowing for development of innovative practice. Having worked for many years in the early years sector, her own personal philosophy is firmly rooted in children being the protagonists of their own learning. Her research interests are in effective communities of practice online and supporting early years practitioner in being reflective, include, including conducting their own research in practice. You will be in for an interesting panel discussion um, together with the panelists and the author. But for right now, I'd like to hand over the time to the brilliant author. Greg, could you please share with us a little bit more about your new interesting title? Absolutely. And th thank you for the wonderful introduction. And um, I have to say, Dr. Elizabeth and uh, Vicky Winner are as fantastic as they sound. Um, essentially, this, this book was designed to be a, a one-stop shop for any teacher who either needs or wants to teach online. Um, moving a bit further on to say also needs to build competence in teaching online or just wants to have a review of relevant literature and best practice to make sure they don't have any gaps uh, in their approach to their online, online teaching process. Uh, each chapter is practically oriented and informed by a combination of a few domains. So one of the key areas I looked at was teacher interviews, um, partly because I have access to a, a vast number of teachers who are professionals and have been dealing with this domain. Um, but also, I think it's an area where we can find a lot of key practical approaches. Uh, of course, research, online classroom scenarios and lesson observations. Uh, as a result, it's fundamentally a teacher-ready handbook of sorts. My goal when writing this book was for this to be the case. Whilst I am a researcher and have published academic research, I'm more oriented to teacher, student and parent friendly language. Um, a certain simplicity and concise wording to make things make sense at first, first glance so you can get things very quickly. Um, I keep true to this for the whole book. And beyond this, I wanted it to have a simple structure, a clear format, which was one of the main pieces of positive feedback I got from the peer review and the teacher review stage of the publication. Um, each chapter, I'm going to have to note, read these down off a note because I don't want to miss one of the moment, uh, one of the parts, but it starts off with a short anecdote. So something I've seen personally. Now, this is just a short paragraph to set the scene and, and essentially wake up people's schemas of knowledge relating to that topic. And then there's the aims of the chapter. There's a done right versus done wrong section. So that's essentially what it looks like if the key learning from this chapter is implemented properly in a classroom, and that's based on classroom scenarios. And then if it's not properly implemented, how poorly could things go for you? Uh, a short introduction, and then the main part of the chapter, which is the research and the practice, conclusion, and then key takeaways. And then, of course, the references at the end. Um, personally, it's been a, a, a fantastic learning journey for me. I've picked up a great deal as a teacher in my own online teaching practice. Beyond that, I've also learned a lot in relation to training teachers for this. So off the back of this book, I've run training sessions for North Anglia globally, and then I've also run drop-in training sessions for a few international schools around the world as well. Um, I personally think it's a fantastic resource for you to read through, and each chapter has practical application. 
So that's the key part of it. It's not just reading to find out some information, which is always interesting. And, and I'm a big advocate of that. But at the end of each chapter, you've got key takeaways, you've got actions. The, books, the book starts with a set of questions that really make you reflect on your own practice and go, okay, how much do I know about this? What am I doing right now? Can I do things better? I don't know so much about platforms. I don't know so much about classroom management. I don't know so much about engaging students or parents or, or error correction. And I don't know these things. But then at the end of the book, these are the key questions or at least some of the key questions that are answered. And then at the end of the book, we have that, those same key questions again for the reader to reflect on and go, OK, now I know this. Now I know this. Now I can do this. Now I can move forwards. I think that's probably everything for me on a, on a book introduction. Um, thank you, Melyani. <laughs> thank you so much, Rag. I think um, I think I personally, having been a student myself, and I do have a younger sister who is currently in school here based in Singapore, um, this book did stand out to me slightly differently because even though I'm not an educator, it gives me... Um, Reading it helps me understand how an educa educator's perspective and not just from a caregiver perspective. So I'm excited to move to the panel discussion because I, I as I understand that um, you were also part of the University of Sutherland as guest speakers and also participate actively. So I'd like to um, have Dr. Elizabeth join us with Vicky um, to share a little bit of um, their thoughts on the book if they had a chance to browse them. Dr. Elizabeth, have you have you had a had a go at the book? What are your thoughts thus far? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I was uh, because I've known Greg for a while, and he's been a, a wonderful contributor to the university community. I was very excited to see that he had a new book coming out, and of course, because it's relevant to the work that we do, um, it's something that we wanted to look at. And in fact, we've already got uh, our library to buy in as an ebook for our students. And to give a little bit of perspective about the work that we, uh, the, the panel members, myself and Vicky and Greg do with the university, we work on an international initial teacher training suite of programs. So the students will be based in their home countries, whether, you know, so in their, if they are working in a school, perhaps as a co-teacher, they will do their postgraduate certificate of education, which is a teacher training qualification um, from their school. There will be people like myself, Vicky and Greg, who will go and observe their teaching and support them. And then the rest of the support comes from mostly UK based, but we do have um, personal academic tutors in other parts of the world. So why would we be so interested in Greg's book? Because we live and breathe online teaching for adult learners, but we are teaching teachers to teach, if that makes sense. And when the global pandemic hit, all of a sudden schools around the world were looking creatively at the way that they could continue the education of their young people. And for many, it was a sudden shift, a, a pivot to online learning for the first time. I will also say that in many parts of the world, uh, the UK included, that educational technology was not as well funded or prioritized as it may have been in years gone by. So, you know, there were a different kind of environment where this sudden need to teach online happened. And it is thanks to people like Greg, who are knowledgeable experts, who are able to teach well, and who are able to explain things clearly and underpin it with research. Thanks to people like Greg, we now have a body of knowledge around how best to do that. A, in a crisis situation, but B, for the ongoing development of educational technology, of learning with technology and through technology. So I would see Greg's book as very much focused around this new knowledge that we know we need and we now have. But even more interestingly, I'm a secondary trained teacher and I work with adult learners. The thoughts of um, turning to online learning with very young children scares me senseless. So I'm going to ask my colleague, Vicky, who runs the Early Years uh, PGCE program, just to give her perspective, because I think from my very secondary and adult 
side of things you know why would we how how even what are your what are your thoughts vicky on on maybe why it's important to know about online teaching for such very young children who we probably wouldn't think about teaching online <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the the pandemic sent especially early years teachers and practitioners into a tailspin of panic of thinking, what do we do now? You know, everywhere is closing. All of the other age groups are going to online teaching. What do we do? Because everything in early years is so practical based. There's a lot of movement, a lot of activities and almost like a, a performance you go in, you know, through <clears throat> throughout your session excuse me so how do you translate that to an online environment where you're not going to be able to build relationships in the same way um, and it astounded us at the flexibility of early years teachers the resilience they showed in trying to develop this online approach but it very much was let's learn as we go let's see how we can develop this and look to our colleagues to be able to try and support us in the development of a different way of teaching and learning that we hadn't been exposed to previously and perhaps it's somewhat neglected in the early years in all honesty because we didn't see that as a priority or something that would ever happen and behold um, a global pandemic brought it about um, a lot quicker than we would have hoped for so I suppose it prepared us and gave us a flavour of what can happen and and that we need to be prepared for this but also opened our eyes to the range of possibilities because we thought it was going to be an impossible act and that this isn't something that can take place for our, our youngest learners. However, um, we've seen some brilliant examples across our trainees, the students, and of course from Greg's examples that he's put into the book that this is something that is possible and that we should also continue to develop, not because we, we might have another pandemic um, and go online, but actually to be able to embed these skills and to be able to look at the use of online technology available creatively and how we can incorporate that into our curriculum now. So are we saying then, Vicky, that online teaching is now going to be a must-have skill for teaching jobs? I'd be interested to see what Greg thinks about that as well. What do you think, Vicky? Do you think that all teachers, including early years teachers, should now be upskilled to in, in online learning and learning with technology? Yeah, absolutely. I think it indicated the pandemic certainly showed us that there was this huge gap that we hadn't considered in early years and that we'd put to one side to say this is in a neat little box and it's for something for older children once they develop and progress into primary that's something that will be explored but more and more I think certainly employers internationally are looking for these skills to be in place for teachers and we have certainly spoke to and coached our trainees um, about their skill set and the need for this digital literacy if you like there's so much available now that allows i mean we're on zoom call now we can all be on screen we can all interact we can watch each other's body language and that all helps significantly compared to um skype calls of the past where it was glitchy and didn't work as well and incredibly difficult to use i think now we're in a good position digitally and increasingly employers want to see that people are at ease with this because if something should happen that we we are going to be prepared for that. So I'd, I'd like to draw Greg in now. Greg, you're on the ground. You work for a very large school group. You, you're out there training teachers. Do you think, um, from your perspective, that, that schools are now actively making sure that teachers have these, these kind of skills when they're recruiting? It's definitely a question that gets brought up in interviews. It definitely is, even with the reduction in teaching online globally. Um, a key thing to add, you mentioned about, first of all, I agree that we are in a good position digitally. I think we have a range of good platforms that, that do fantastic jobs. Um, but definitely recruiters are looking at this. Um, search associates, there's a little box. For, uh, search associates is an international teacher recruitment platform for people who don't know. Um, there's now a little box that you need to tick if you have got experience teaching online. And I think I saw it on tests in Korea as well, but I, I would have to double check. Mm -hmm. But definitely it's in Search Associates. So 
recruiters are looking at this and they want to know that teachers are prepared for it for a range of reasons I think because partly if something bad happens like a, a pandemic people want their teachers to be prepared and ready to go into this online teaching experience that schools um, have been facing but beyond that because blended learning is a growing area parents want communication through a, a range of mediums parents want homework sent home in different ways virtually so aspects of this are now being fed into everyday curricula I'd absolutely agree. And one of the questions that, that Vicky and I had discussed when we were reviewing your book was about you know, transferable skills, which are the platforms. And we likened it a little bit to trainers. You'll love this one, Greg. Um, you know, when you buy a pair of trainers, you look for the features. You may not necessarily, or you might be very connected to the brand of the trainers. But you know, if, if you're a runner or you're a tennis player or you're a fitness person, you're looking for particular features. And you've alluded to some of those there. And also the, the increase in um, expectations from the parents. But of course, apart from, and we joke in the UK that we won't have any more snow days, you know, where children can't come to school because of snow, we'll just all jump online. And in fact, my own um, youngest child has, their school has moved all of their parents' evenings online, which is brilliant because you don't have to go and queue up and, and, and try and get your slot. But there is actually an educational perspective and Vicky is the, the knowledgeable Kind of early years person in, in my arena and we had a discussion because she went to Italy recently and and the online learning elements there that, that we were discussing I think will add something to this kind of from the educational perspective Vicky the the atelier idea that you were talking to me about yeah absolutely so um I was lucky enough to go and be able to visit Reggio Amelia so for early years people you know Reggio Amelia is a, a, a huge um um, approach that is talked about and renowned globally so when we went out the approach is very much about children being their own protagonists of learning and being able to explore natural materials and have creative opportunities so I was really surprised when we got to look around and explore that they had a digital atelier and I kind of looked at it and said well you know, how do you explore this with the children? They said, well, they're so much more digitally literate than, than the staff that we're taking their lead anyway. Um, but they just set things up and allow the children to explore. And, and that's translated now into the UK. I'm seeing increasingly settings want to try and replicate this kind of environment, have these resources available. So for many years and earlier, as we've looked at loose parts, recycled content and had open ended resources, but never thought of it in a, in a digital manner. And it was interesting to see the use of things like um, stop motion apps where the children can create something that is rather painstaking, I must say, and take a long, long time to get at the smallest snippet of motion picture, but something that the children respond incredibly well to. And this is from three, three to four year old in nursery school age. Um, and um, they have green screens as well so that children can go on and see themselves interacting with different backgrounds and be fascinated by that, but also build in the sense of self and, and have opportunities that previously, perhaps earlier as teachers have thought, they need more concrete materials there to be able to do that with. But it's, it's a surprise to see young children, very young children, be so adept at using this material and content. But I think it's part of life now you know maybe we'd be doing an injustice to the children to not embrace that and, and bring it about ourselves and I suppose for for staff for colleagues in early years it brings a sense of nervousness because maybe they've never heard of, of stop motion maybe they've never used green screen apps um, so it is very much trial and error and about giving them the confidence and I think what you do Greg is is give them the courage to say try it you know give them links to try different things maybe try out things like different whiteboard or interactive tools that you can use on the screen with the children so it's not a case of just us sitting talking at the children through a screen for a length of time they can be involved in things yeah and one of the key, one of the key yeah. things oh sorry go ahead <laughs> Go no, I'm just saying, you know, my computing heart is, is kind of beating there, like, yeah, yay for technology with young people. Go for it. Sorry, Greg, go ahead. No, 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 no. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, just off the back of that, it's uh, th there was a few things 
firing away in my head. First of all, I was thinking about extracurricular activities and we run our tech-based extracurricular activities um, through inquiry. So scratch coding, was it was completely student-led. There was a teacher present, but the teacher didn't teach. It was facilitation in the purest form whereby they sh the teacher showed the students how to open the app and said, play, go ahead. And the kids had to go ahead and, and move through and figure out building their own little codes, essentially. But the same thing for stop motion as well, the same process. I think there was a little bit more of a model made with the stop motion because there was the some of the buttons were a little bit more confusing than uh, the scratch coding app. But that said, I think the students could really just go for it. Um, yeah, and then just thinking about green screen as well, I've, uh, activities firing away in my head for language teachers or English teachers or anyone working within things like global leadership. Um, presentations go very well with green screens. You can set different contexts for students to be presenting. They can be news reporters. They can be um, they can be acting in a in a Marvel superhero movie, and that allows you to build in a little bit more of this engagement um, engagement aspect. So embedding the context in the learning, making sure so they love Marvel. Well, they can do their presentation with a Marvel green screen, and they can pretend to be the Hulk as long as they're talking about the and using the language you want them to learn, for example. Um, and then there was one more thing, it, it popped into my head. Which one was that? If it, if it falls back in, I'll, I'll bring it up. I think it's escaped me for now. Oh no, there was one more thing. You mentioned the whiteboards, yeah. So where yeah. students can have play on virtual whiteboards and all interact in that way. It works much better with smaller classes or large classes if you can allocate who can do it at a time. You don't want 30, 40, 50 students all, they just scribble on the screen, uh, which can be okay to let them do at the start of a lesson and get some of that out of their system. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, if you increase the participation rates of students within lessons, this is both online and offline. Um, and I found it in, in independently in research for both, you increase their levels of satisfaction with the online course and with the yeah. delivered course. I love how practical these examples are becoming because when I first heard green screen, my immediate thought was that the physical use of green screen. But as you just mentioned, you know, even the fact that we can change our backgrounds and, and have children from their own background looking to see how they can present themselves in front of a green screen, that's wonderful. And I love the idea of the, the, the virtual whiteboards because of course, as a teacher, I'm used to seeing whiteboards in classrooms, but as a computing teacher, I used to be able to have a, a screen in my classroom where I could see on my screen what everybody was doing in the classroom. And they, it would be like magic. I'd be, oh, Susie, what do you do? Can you do, can you do this out of the other? And they'd be a bit surprised because of course I could see that. And, and it's a very small leap therefore, because the technology can do that sort of thing to move to the online whiteboard system. And how practical and useful is that? And I worked with a, a trainee early years person who was doing their action research on our program um, into handwriting and COVID stopped everything. And she was worrying about the children's motor skills and, and how they would be able to form the writing. So we tried this hack where you put a mirror underneath the um, webcam and then it turns it into a little bit of like a visualizer. And she was able to, to work with the parent and the child to make sure that the child was forming the letters correctly. And I just mm. think you know, we, there are so many amazing thoughts and ideas out there. And, and it's only by bringing them to teachers in an accessible and understandable way that we can get those light bulb moments. And I think, as Vicky said, you do that so well, Greg, you, you, you make what might seem like a mountain to climb, suddenly much more like a, a journey of a few steps. Like, oh, okay, I'll try this and I'll try this and I'll try this. And I, I think you do bridge that gap between theory and practice. And I think that's wonderful because we're always encouraging teachers to ask those questions. How do we do this? Why do we do this? How can we do it better? Because we can be better, not because we're not good enough, but because we can be better. And I love that you've got these very practical ideas. I like that you mentioned about engagement because it was something that uh, we we spoke about. But I suppose back to the um, you know to the to the teacher teaching, and you mentioned an inquiry based approach, and we've talked about online learning. But how does your face to face teaching style 
translate online, does your average teacher need to change the way they are with young people? Or is that more of a seamless transition? I'd be very curious, Greg, from your experience of, of working you know, in the sector at this time, what do you think about that? Do you think teachers can be themselves or do they have to be a bit different online? I think they can keep their teacher persona and perhaps if they're more, of course you have more lively and energetic teachers and then you have less lively, let's say, teachers. Um, I do think the lively side of teacher finds it easier to teach online um, because you need to draw the attention to you. But there are still ways to do that without being lively. There's ways in Zoom I can put bunny rabbit ears on my head and you don't have to be lively to do it. You can just put the bunny rabbit ears on your head and perhaps that's even better if you're not lively and you've got bunny rabbit ears. All the students will be zoned in and, and really focused on you. Um, there's lots of things that translate from a normal uh, traditional classroom and face to face classroom that work very well and, and translate well into online. Um, some things work better. One of the key things I mentioned in the book is that proximity praise in an online learning environment is within proximity to every student because all the students are in one collective on the screen. It's not, they're not sat next to one student and a classroom away from the other student. There is no front line of the class and no back corner where they can drift off. They're all in the same space. So if you have a student who's perhaps sat with correct posture, which is really important, you can go, uh, Jenny, wonderful, perfect. Look how well you're sitting. That's so good. I'm going to email mom and dad after class and tell them how happy I am, and how great that is. All the students straight away like this, because they're all within proximity to that, <laughs> to that student. Um, beyond that, I think, I think really making sure you, you use your language well. Um, you don't have so much that you can use to create emphasis. In a classroom, you can move around the room more easily. You can go to the back of the room and point at the board, which is all these different techniques to reframe yourself in a room. It's very hard to do online. But actually, this is just coming to my head right now. There are cameras that can follow you around the room. So maybe that could be an option, but you'd need to really think about what's in the room. Um, I personally like these blackout uh, backgrounds because then you can go okay my house is messy nobody knows <laughs> I, I have seen some very interesting um moving cameras we use one at work for when we're having a meeting a sort of 360 camera that follows us around depending who's speaking and i've seen that used very well for teaching adults um, and you know it's nice that you've prompted me to think about how that might be used in a classroom setting much more of a, an environment and I know that Vicky Wynn, you are going to be thinking there about body language, about whole body movement. Um, I, I know you're, you're probably itching to say something about that kind of physical presence in the classroom. Do you want to chip in? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Liz, when we were talking about um, the, the chapters the other day and we're talking about particularly the physical aspect, um, I said in early years, we get up and just move a lot more than other year groups, I suppose. Um, and it's really important to build those times in. And when you're in the classroom, you can sense by the body language of the children if they're starting to lose focus, if they're not as on task as you would like them to be. And when you need to say, OK, let's stop and have that brain break and, and move around. But also, as the teacher in early years, you do move an awful lot around the classroom um, and you're very active and you don't have that option as much when you're sat in front of a screen. I suppose if you used a different device, like you say, you can get up, you can use the tracking camera to still be in your class and move around and demonstrate. But if you've got children online, I suppose, where they have cameras off, um, then maybe not as present or they just say, no, I'm not moving today. <laughs> just sit there you know how do you facilitate that online and I suppose I said to Liz this is where in early years especially we've always said parent partnership is crucial and you've touched upon it a little bit Greg and saying you know parents 
expect more online content and virtual presence from teachers. So I suppose that's the key, isn't it? Having that communication and setting those expectations, not just for your class of children, but also parents. We need you on board a little bit here as well to make sure that we are getting the movement, the actions, even if it is being able to see how they're holding a pen at that moment in time, if that's what your focus is on. Um, yes, but I think that's definitely a concern that myself and many colleagues had was around the physical aspect and they noticed a, a, quite a decline in children's physical skills upon the return to school following that big COVID break. Yeah, definitely. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> you know me, Greg, I, I just love talking to people about what we do, but please, you know, the platform is yours. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to add definitely parent involvement is a key driver of academics and student positive feeling towards school as long as it's done well one thing i say in the book is um do not rely on parents to deliver content it, it murkies the relationship between the parent and the child so they can be involved in the rewards in the positivity they can be involved in the, the student area set up um, off the top of my head one thing if the students say no i'm not moving they don't move that's that. Say so that's okay. And then perhaps reward some students who are moving. A little bit of motivation goes a long way. Um, that there, there are, it is a key concern having that movement and having that freedom for students to interact really, really fully together. Um, I don't think that gap will ever fully be bridged from having students in a classroom where they could play together in that way. Um, can we? still have them play together can we still have them interact absolutely absolutely um again early years it's it is more challenging but you can use things like breakout rooms you just have to have very short time frames firstly for the online lessons they need to be short they need to be short and many countries actually don't allow early years to to learn online so you, you also need to follow the policy of your country <laughs> That's the first thing. And then the second thing is bear in mind, these need to be short lessons. Um, and if you use things like breakout rooms, I'm doing a piece of research about breakout rooms at the minute. And one really interesting thing to me that I never thought of, but it's so obvious, is just using a student leader in the breakout room. It's so obvious because you have a, a team leader in your teams and in your groups in class, you have roles for the students. But just having one student who is going to lead that group for that 45 seconds, one minute, maybe start small, grow it. My my class currently, I, I teach on a reduced timetable, but I still I still teach and I don't want that to change. Um, we I've got to the point with them for breakout rooms and we, we're just finishing online teaching now and we'll be back in class after Chinese New Year uh, with the new policies in China. Um, I've got to the point with breakout rooms where when the time limit finishes, we'll come back to the main classroom and they'll say, can we go back in? Can we go back in? And I'll dot into the breakout rooms and they'll be on topic. Uh, that takes motivation. I have to say to them before they go, I'll be dropping in. If I hear you talking about the topic, where, as soon as I arrive, not I arrive and then silence turns into talking. If I hear mid flow conversation there'll be some form of reward there'll be some a message to mom and dad there'll be there'll be something that they like um one thing i do for my classes if if they meet some targets and goals i'll buy some uh, uh i think they're called like graphic novel books like dogman or mm -hmm. cat kid um and it's like a treat reading so they can read their leveled books whenever they want that's great but can they read dogman in guided reading lesson Maybe it's a treat. <laughs> wonderful. And actually, that's a wonderful segue. When Vicky and I were talking, I decided to be a little bit controversial. And I said, OK, Vicky, is it gamification or is it just edutainment? And we got to this idea of what are the cringy things that you think, oh, why are they doing that in an online space? And I don't I feel that Vicky is probably well qualified to talk about these 
the, the, the controversy of is it gamification or is it edutainment for the younger student? Vicky, go go for it. I know you've got something to say about these things. Yeah. Really well, this, this, this whole discussion ended up with me and Liz and, and another colleague engaging about an hour's worth of discussion and debate over what is and isn't acceptable because you do feel very strongly about it. And certainly if I go into a physical classroom um, and it's face-to-face -face teaching, I would not be the happiest um, supervisor, shall we say, if I saw YouTube videos being played repeatedly for early years children. Um, because it's not the best use of time and you as the practitioner are the best resource for those children so don't don't revert to YouTube videos no matter what you think of them however in an online context there's only so much of you on screen the children can take I believe um, and use correctly you know yes use YouTube videos and, and our colleague was saying you know in secondary we would use content if it's there why try and reinvent the wheel use content that is available and I said my issue is I suppose where it's just played for children for a long period of time with no pause or break or reviewing of the content I'd expect it to be built properly into the lesson plan and used as part of the lesson rather than just something that can maybe hold the children for, for a few minutes while you have a break or something like that um, so yeah and when we talk about edutainment I think a lot of early years we do need that because those children, the youngest children, don't have the longest attention span. So <laughs> to be able to engage the children, we need to change things up. And I suppose, especially in an online context, you need to make it exciting for them and involved. And now, because they all have access to so many devices, they likely have favourite things. So like Greg touched upon in terms of the inquiry base, if you can do the green screen as Marvel, and that engages children why not so if you know there's a really popular video that the children like and it's something a song about patterns meatball meatball banana i believe is one of the favorites liz found that hilarious um so she said we move in different worlds entirely but yes if you want to use that that's fine but then review and reflect with the children and make that part of your lesson would you agree craig Absolutely, yeah, and I think game of gamification and edutainment, it's it's a really interesting topic. Um, I've been exploring it recently, but what I've, some key things I found in the research was that the if you're gonna use gamification, for example, keep it student focused, keep it content focused, and try to move away from game, like the focus purely on the game. You want the student's interest to be in the content and in their interactions. Um, live versus non-live, oh, I wrote this down because um, if I, I really like this concept, if there's content there, use it. Um, I agree completely, I agree completely. At the same time, we have to be mindful of the difference between live delivery and pre-recorded delivery. We have this conception of watching, uh, a presentation say if the ceo of your company records a presentation a 20 minute presentation and you all get taken to a hall and you sit and watch the recorded presentation nobody's happy no one <laughs> enjoys that no one but if the ceo comes to your outlet your school your business whatever your institution may be if they come and give a 20 minute delivery some people won't be happy with it they want their 20 minutes fair play to them but overwhelmingly, people will feel more positively about that because it's delivered in a live fashion. It also, I think a way, a way around that if you are using little video clips uh, with your classes, um, and this is true for all ages and in all contexts, first of all, give them a purpose for that clip. So if, if say the clip is about solids, liquids and gases, set three questions at the start what is a solid what is a liquid what is a gas or if they already know some students know that you can give them a, a more challenging question tell me one thing you learn about solids from this tell me one thing you learn about liquids tell me one thing you learn about gases um yeah i've, I've run into a wall there 
<laughs> right. Uh, I'm so sorry to break up the conversation. I, I, I wanted to, to join in right at the beginning, but I, I thought it was a perfect moment because educators do come together and then they see they really bounce off a lot of great ideas. Um, and just like that, it's time passed so fast. Uh, but I, I do have um, some areas that I, I thought I bounce off with with um, with three of you. Firstly is um, I, I did observe um, conversations about Paris involvement um, my think, uh, or rather, my question would be: um, Do at this point do we do we believe that parents are effectively as secondary teachers in an online setting? Um, I know Greg mentioned that we try not to rely on parents to separate um, those two, but um, how can we? How can we? How can parents support that online learning, for, for especially for the young learners, um, and and what are some of the things that parents can do um, if they were to be, if they were be put in a role to, to support the learning of their children? If I, I, I'm not too sure if I'm getting my questions out right, but basically I just want to know um, from a perspective, because I personally think that parents are essentially the next educator in line after what they see online. So how can parents support that for their children? Absolutely. It's a very it's a very good question. Um, and definitely parents are an educator of their children. They absolutely are. Um, the distinction I would draw is the teacher relying on the parent to deliver content for the teacher. It doesn't. Well, it, it's not my opinion. This is this is established in the research. It, it seems not to be the way to go. How can parents then help children? Um, I would say, especially with the primary and kindergarten phases, and to, to a lesser degree with older learners too, but still relevant, especially in online learning, the learning space needs to be set up appropriately. The mm. student, um, two studies I came across showed that 0% of students start online lessons with proper posture. Incorrect posture in online learning leads to, well, it's directly correlated with uh, low levels of engagement. And as the lesson progresses, posture becomes worse. So parents can help set the learning environment such that students can sit with proper posture, have, have a space where the screen is elevated to eye height, right? Have a seat where the student can sit and they have right angle knees with their feet on the floor. If their feet don't reach the floor, stack some books up, find a way, find, right. find a safe way. Right. And I think um, there is an additional resource on the correct seating posture that you have helped uh, contributed to our Routledge blog, uh, which will be made available in a while. Um, the next question that that was um, that I had in mind is um, in early years, especially there is always this screen time restriction and uh, in online teaching setting, they are exposed to these things. So but when school ends, um, and they have to go back to not having screen time. That that is a that is that's, that becomes a little bit of a challenge. So how can how how do how can we how can teachers ensure that okay screen time equals to the time where you're at um, here and you're not distracted, and then when you switch off, it's a different environment. Do teachers struggle with that now that blended learning is a thing? Absolutely. I think from discussions with trainees and colleagues, you know, all we can do is provide as much information as possible to parents. You know, knowledge is power. Give them all of the information to hand to say this is the recommended level of screen time. Yes, we're online, but we're going to have moments where we send the children to do activities or to move around. And it's not just staring at that screen or just swiping things all of the time. So it's about a balance, you know, and then having... I suppose faith in that we've given the parents the, the knowledge that we can do and hope that things um, are implemented and in place and that the children have a good balance. But as mentioned, you know, we've we've seen upon the return to school from COVID um, closures and such that children have got some delays in their physical development that they are finding certain aspects difficult because they have had this screen time and it's important as educators not to judge the parents for that as well um, as much as we know um, that the balance is needed as, as parents they were in a tough situation as well and often working from home themselves and having to monitor the home learning and screen time sometimes 
they just need 10, 15 minutes break to be able to have some respite. We can't judge people for that. You do what you need to do. However, it's then our responsibility to, to be able to assess the children's development, see where we are in terms of what they need and be able to adjust our plan accordingly. Fantastic. Um, the other area that uh, I think a lot of um, the, some of the educators who are, judged, who are streaming in would have would be class management. I think in a in a classroom setting, um, it's much easier for a teacher to um, okay indicate or uh, be aware of okay maybe perhaps this student would need extra help or extra guidance or uh, one of the students is not as engaging as the other. But in an online setting with so many screens.